Hi everyone, my name is Roy Hassan. Uh, I'm a analytics specialist at AWS. Um, I work with a lot of customers uh, to build uh, and optimize their data platforms. Um, and one of the common questions that I get, and this is not just from users that are building data platform, this is just anybody who's using um, AWS, is how do I analyze quickly the logs that my infrastructure is, is generating. And one common one is CloudTrail. If you're not familiar with AWS, CloudTrail is a service that allows you to collect uh, all the API events from all of your infrastructure, for AWS infrastructure, into the single service. And then from there, you can extract the data and you can analyze it. So what I wanted to do today is take that example and show you how to analyze um, Amazon Athena events uh, using Athena uh, to be able to understand how um, our users are using Athena. So let's um, let's start by uh, looking at the data. So if you enable CloudTrail, it will output it into a bucket of your choice. In my case, I pick this, and you can see it has a particular region, and it breaks it up by by year, month, and day. Um, and inside here, you'll see a bunch of JSON files, um, GZIP compressed. So Athena can, can easily read the compressed data. So that's, that's kind of the, the data set. So the next thing we want to do is we have to create a table. Um, we have this in our documentation. I'm just going to paste it here so it's easier. Uh, but you can see some of the fields are nested struct, fairly deeply nested, and you'll see that in a minute as well. So I just kind of run this query. All right, so that, um, that completed. What we can do now is we can do select star from... Um, this data set, uh, what is it called? Raw Cloud Trail uh, logs, and let's just limit it to 10. We don't care about more than that. All right, so now we can see a bunch of data, the user identity field. Um, there's a bunch of interesting columns here, like the, the event time, the event source, what service sent this, STS, S3. Uh, the event name, right, which API was was called, uh, and a bunch of other parameters and, and the request parameters, which is the, the more interesting one. Um, so the first thing we, uh, we really want to do here is we want to just um, analyze this data a little bit more. So let's, um, let's uh, start with, uh, and I just paste a query in here that I already have. Let's just filter it on Athena events that we're interested in. So We'll, look, we'll use the event source of Athena, the event name to start query execution. So this is the API that starts a query or runs a query. I just run this quickly. And we can see here that the user identity has a bunch of information in it. We'll parse that in a minute. Um, and then we can see Athena is the event source and the name is the API is this. And in the request parameters, you can actually see the query that was executed. Um, you know, you can encrypt this so it's not accessible to anybody, but in this case, I left it like this so we can actually analyze it. There's also some other parameters in here uh, that we may want to look at later on, like the upward location uh, and, and the work group that was used. So the, the first thing that we want to do next is let's just kind of break this up a little, a little bit and, and add some more um, or extract some more columns. We need some room here. So uh, the first thing that I wanted to do is look at the date, uh, the timestamp here, and convert it from string to a date format or timestamp format. It's easier for you to see. So we'll use a function called uh, MISO 8601 timestamp. And we want to do it event time as BT. All right. The next thing is we want to use, we want to look at the user identity. Uh, so the user identity type. Um, oh, we just want to save it as a session type, right? And this tells us whether it's a, a role, an IEM user, a root account. Uh, it'll be good to understand what types of, of IEM users are accessing our, our data, our, our Athena. Uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to look at the username of that, um, that identity. Now, the username, based on what role, it's stored in a different uh, field inside of the user identity uh, struct or element. So we'll just use a simple case statement. Um, mission username. And let's just say when the user identity is assumed role. 
right? Um, then the user identity <clears throat> dot session context dot it's in the session issuer um, that username. And I did a little bit of homework beforehand, so you don't have to spend time on this. Um, and if it's not, then it's a user identity that username is the field that we want to grab the username from. Um, so it's session context session issuer. Okay, cool. So we got we got that part. Um, next thing we want to do is we want to grab the user agent, right? User agent. Uh, let's also grab their request par parameters just so we can uh, dig into that a little bit more. Um, okay, so we have that. Let's just run our query. Awesome. So now we have the user, the session type. We have it here. We have the, the session username. Uh, this particular is a, is a Lambda function that's using this, this particular role. Um, it's using this user agent. Great. And then we have the, the, the SQL. Um, the next thing that I think we should do, and I'm just going to copy this and paste it so it's easier, less, less typing and less clicking for you to listen to. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go in here and we're going to add uh, these, these two lines. And, and what these two lines do is the first one is using a JSON extract function. And there are two functions that you can use JSON extract, which extracts, uh, looks at a JSON string and extract another uh, a set of data, but returns you a JSON string in return. Uh, the extract scaler takes that and returns you a SQL native uh, type, right? So in this case, we're using the JSON extract function you, with a JSON path to find the output location and return it as a string rather than returning it as a JSON string, returning it as a SQL string. So it's easier for us to work with. So once we return that, that in, we're going to pass it to a URL extract host function that will take out the host name of that string because uh, it's an S3 path. The host name is a bucket name. And when we're going to, we're going to upload that into the upload bucket column. Um, doing something very similar in the next function, but we wanted to basically grab the work group. Um, so again, using JSON path to go into the, the work group field and grab that out. And because I'm using extract scalar, it's going to return it as a string. Um, so let's just run this. And we should be able to see here. So we have the output bucket and it gave us only the bucket name. There's no work group in this case because this particular Lambda function is not using work groups. Uh, and it was created before uh, work groups were being uh, were, uh, mandatory. So we have it, uh, it's empty, but I, I have others that, that show it. Um, so that's, that's um, the next thing that we can do. So the, the second thing I wanted to do is, um, what I thought it would be, would be helpful is, if we look at the query string itself and try to understand um, from the query, what type of queries our users are running, right? Are these a lot of select queries? Do we see a lot of create queries or drop queries? Um, so I have a, a fairly naive approach to, to that problem. I'm sure you can find a different way to solve it, but um, what we can do is just add a case statement here that again uses um, the JSON extract function to go to the request parameters column and extract the query string. And from there, we return it as a, as a SQL string. And then using regular expression, we are checking if there's any keywords in that string. And based on that, we're going to bucket it into specific uh, query types, right? Whether it's a create statement, an insert statement, a select, a drop. Um, again, this is naive. There, there could be a lot of different variations to this. But in most cases, this is, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, and if we don't know, if we can't figure it out, then the default will just select, right? That's typically what the queries are. And then we're going to save it as a SQL op um, column. So let's just run this. All right. So now you can see that we get all the same information we had before. Um, but now we have this SQL op column that tells us uh, what type of query was run, select query, or create query, etc. Um, so now that we have this created, what we want to do is, uh, and this is how we make it really easy for our users, is we want to take this all this work that we've done and actually create a table out of that. And the way we do it is we use a create table statement that looks kind of like this. So you do create table, we give it a name, let's just call it staging. 
Um, and, and then we, we pass it a, a parameter called width. And width allows us to define different um, characteristics of our table. So the first thing we want to do is we want to we want to define a, a format. Let's just call it uh, parquet. Um, so that's that's the format that we want. We want to save in parquet. It's automatically going to be compressed uh, in Snappy, so you don't have to do that in addition. Uh, you can add partitioning. You can do partition by uh, and give it an array uh, of columns. Um, you know, column IDs, whatever they may be. In this case, I'm not going to partition it because um, I, I don't need to partition it. But what I am going to do is I'm going to bucket it. So uh, bucketed by, and it's the same syntax. So array, I'm actually going to use the DT column, the daytime column that we created. Uh, and I'm also going to pick uh, three buckets. And what bucketing does is it takes the data and it sorts it based on the column that you've given, in this case, DT. And then it, it tries to evenly split that data up into those uh, the number of buckets that you gave it. All right? So you're going to end up with three buckets. And in, in, in the scene of three buckets equals three files. And you'll see this in a second uh, in, in S3. Um, so this is this is a form of optimization, especially for these kind of temp tables that we're creating that we're going to use and eventually throw away. Um, it's it's a good way to optimize because we're sorting the data in advance. Um, we're reducing the number of files. We're keeping the files in in in, uh, in a manageable size, and we make it easier and, and more performant for Athena to, to query. The next thing the next thing I wanted to also do here is um, change the location. So this is the location where the data will be saved into. Uh, so we're going to use Athena output. Oops. Output. We'll just give it, um, you know, just a, a location, right? Um, and and what this does is it takes the the table that we're creating and it puts it in this particular bucket. Now, if you don't do this by default, it's going to put it into the folder that you define in your Athena configuration, which is um, under here, right? Uh, so you can you can easily do that, but if you want to put the data in a specific location, you can set your external uh, location. Now, once you do that, you do as, um, and then uh, you can run the query. Now, the one thing that I forgot to do here is that the bucketed by feature does not support timestamp, uh, but it does support a date stamp. So we have to convert this timestamp into a date. Um, so we, we, we do it like this. So I'm, I'm not going to run this because I already did, and it takes a couple minutes. I'm going to save a couple minutes here. Um, but once you run this, uh, you end up with a staging table that looks like this, right? We have our, our columns, um, and it's, it's already there, ready to go. So what I'm going to do is now just quickly preview this table. Great. So now you can see here, it's exactly what we created before just in a table ready for us to, to work with. Um, so now that we've done all the data prep, fairly straightforward. There's a lot of functions already available for you in Athena that you can use. Um, once you've used those functions and you, you prepare the data and you structure it in a way that makes sense to you, you can then create these temp tables, temporary tables for yourself to analyze. Maybe you can connect them to you know, Amazon QuickSight for visualization, share them with other people, uh, but they're easy to work with, they're optimized, um, and you get the best performance and the best cost savings. So maybe a couple of things that we can do here is uh, let's just show how many times uh, a particular SQL query type was run. So we're going to look at the SQL op column. We're going to count it, um, and then we're going to order uh, group it by the SQL operation and, and order it. Um, so very quickly, right? We see we have about a, over a, you know 1,100 uh, queries that were run that were select queries. There's a bunch of create queries, right? This is creating new tables, creating table as select statements. Uh, there's a few inserts and a few drops that we did. Um, so this is cool. We're just going to get an idea of what type of queries our users are running. Um, another, another one that may be interesting for us to, to look at is the work groups that I talked about. So here we're going to select the work groups and we're going to count how many queries uh, were executed per work group. Um, and we're going to buck, uh, we're going to group them by the work group. So you can see here that we have a bunch of work groups. There's an empty work group. That's the, the Lambda function. Uh, there's a whole lot of queries being run from that function, but it's not in a work group. So that's something maybe we should go back and look at. Let's update 
the lambda function to use the work group so we can actually track it in case something happens we can put cost controls around it to stop it from 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 over overspending um, we can also see that you know our reporting team you know ran you know about 52 queries uh, ad hoc users are running uh, you know 31 queries um, there's a bunch of queries running against the the preview functionality work group so people are testing new features uh, so that's great right there's a lot of cool things so just to kind of re recap what we talked about, um, AWS CloudTrail is a place where you store a lot of the inf your AWS infrastructure logs. So anything you do in AWS gets captured there. So it's a goldmine of information to see how users are using your service and how services are inter interacting with each other. Uh, we focused on the Athena events in particular, uh, looking at those that were starting queries so we can see what SQL queries are being run. Uh, we transformed it, we cleaned it, and then we derived the table out of that. We created a new table out of that transformations. So now we're able to very quickly analyze it and use it uh, and also visualize it. So that's it. Um, hopefully this was uh, interesting for you. And hopefully this will get you uh, starting analyzing some CloudTrail data using Amazon Athena. So thank you very much for the time. Take care.